Good morning. Welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Daphne Jones. I'm the spiritual growth and, and, uh, and I forgot what I am. I'm the spiritual growth and connections director here at the bridge. This is new. I, I have some additional responsibilities. I'm sinking into them. Uh, so I want to start by polling the audience. How many of you are enjoying this series? Clap your hand. Clap your hand. Okay. Keep clapping if you came to be encouraged. If you came to hear a message that will uplift your heart, clap your hands if you came just to spend time with other people that you don't get to see during the week. Okay, that, I, I hear fewer. Clap your hand if, if you're probably going to run out right after the message. Okay, <laughs> some of you are honest. Um, clap your hand if you've ever said, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? That, that's something um, we often say, what's in it for me often determines what we will commit to, what we will sacrifice for, whether we will stay, what's in it for me? Because truth be told, if our needs aren't met, if our desires aren't fulfilled, sometimes we go. If our needs aren't met, we leave teams, we'll even leave churches. Our needs and our desires are the, it's the reason oftentimes that we pursue relationships and that we stay in relationships. While preparing for this message, um, again, we're in part seven of our Love is Greater series, I came across this, this quote that says, love begins when someone else's needs are more important than my own. Love begins when someone else's needs are more important than my own. How befitting as we jump back into 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's see how scripture today is going to magnify that concept that love begins when someone else's needs are greater than my own. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you don't have a copy of the scriptures, either on your phone or a print copy, you will see it on the screen. So we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We'll look at verses 1 through 5. So if you've been with us for a few weeks or if you're following us online, these verses may uh, sound familiar to you. If I speak with tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move, remove mountains, the praise team just sing about mountains that won't stop us, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Verse 4, love is patient, love is kind, it is not jealous, does not brag, and is not arrogant, does not, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own. So we're here in this passage where Paul, he's addressing the issue of love because the people in the church of Corinth, they're excited about all these spiritual gifts and wanting to have certain gifts and to use them. And he kind of stops them so they can consider the fact that if you're, you have all these gifts and you're doing all of these good deeds, but you don't have love, it really means nothing. And so he's unpacking in this passage what love is and what it isn't. So today we're picking up in verse 5 where it says, love does not seek its own. In some of your translations it may read, love is not self-seeking. Some of your translations may read, love does not demand its own way. And some may read, it does not insist on its own way. Love does not seek its own. So what, what does it mean to be self-seeking? By definition, self-seeking means given or characterized by seeking one's own interests or selfish ends. So what is selfish? Devoted to or caring only for oneself, concerned primarily with one's own interests, benefits, welfare, etc., regardless of others. So how many of us are selfish? Oh, we have some honest people. Okay. By human standards, some of us may say, I'm not selfish. I, I care about others. I think about others. But when we look at God and measure ourselves against his standards and the agape love that's described in this passage, agape meaning a love that 
emulates the way God loves us, if we're challenged and called to love in that way, we fall short as it pertains to selfishness. Meanwhile, God wants us to grow up. So I'm going to share some examples with you to make us think about what well, maybe I don't quite measure up. Maybe I can do better as it pertains to being loving and not being so consumed with me. Uh, this spring session of our small groups, I'm actually, I have the privilege of connecting with one of our small group coaches and a future coach. And we're going through this study, um, studying about what it means to be a disciple and what it means to make disciples who make disciples. Because our coaches, they are pouring into group leaders who pour into group members that hopefully will start other groups. So we're wanting to grow as coaches so we can better serve those who are leading and serving here at the bridge. And this week, uh, we were exploring the stages of spiritual maturity. And the author identified four different stages we may encounter people in um, after they've decided to follow Jesus. So there's the infant stage, the child stage, the young adult stage, and then there's the adult stage. So I want to share with you what the author said about the child. We all struggle with selfish, selfishness from time to time, but children are self-centered because the center of their world and interpreting everything from the perspective of me. Spiritually speaking, children are more concerned about their needs than the needs of others. Now, if you have children or you've spent significant time with children or maybe you study human development, you will know this to be true. We have a two-year-old at home. If she comes up here, this will be my water, as in hers. This will be my iPad, my food. It's my, 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 me, 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 me. Have you observed that behavior? That, that's true of children. Now, con contrast this with statements that a young adult may say. Well, no, first, let me share the statements. These are some more statements that the author says, not that net, but the author said that um, children are those who are children in Christ are less mature these are some statements they may say. Who are all these new people coming to our church? The church is getting too big. I love my small group. Don't add any more people to it. My small group is not taking care of my needs like they should. I don't have anyone who is spending enough time with me. No one is discipling me. I am not being fed in my church, so I'm going to a church that meets my needs. Now contrast this with the spiritual young adult. They may say, I love my group, but others, there are others who need a group like this. I notice we don't have a seniors visitation team. Do you think I could be involved? And then as we reach the spiritual parent, they describe that as individuals who are now invested in the mission and vision and they're intentionally making disciples who in turn make disciples. A spiritual parent would say something like this. Someone at work asked me to go explain the Bible to her. Pray for me. Someone from our small group recently got baptized. I want to get him plugged into ministry somewhere. I realized that discipleship happens at home too. Will you hold me accountable to spend time discipling my children? So a child asks, what's in it for me? As we mature and we become adults, we say, how can I look out for the family? How can I establish a legacy that impacts generations beyond me? So as we're maturing, we're less focused on me and more focused on we. And we even see that in scripture as we look at Christ's example of what true love really is and looks like. It goes from the focus being on me to we, the others that God has called us to impact. It turns from the focus from me to we and from my to his, to God's agenda. And we're going to take a look at this in scripture. Let's turn to Philippians chapter two. We are going to get a great example of what grown up behavior looks like. So we're looking at Philippians chapter two, verses one through four. I'll give you time to turn. It says in this passage, beginning at verse two, therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. 
Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. In the first two uh, verses, we see he begins with an uh, uh, if-then uh, statement. He, the presupposition is that you are loving, you are united in Christ, the Spirit dwells within you. And so with that in view, he then sets out what we need to do. So he says this, do nothing from selfishness, meaning a desire to put oneself forward. And in this passage, the term translated selfishness also means to, to be as those who electioneer for office. They're courting for public applause. So you're putting your agenda first. So do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, being vain glory or groundless self-esteem but with humility of mind as having a humble opinion of oneself, a deep sense of one's moral littleness or lowliness of mind. And again, the comparison is between us and God. So when we compare ourselves to God and his standards, we aren't that great. We aren't that good. So we may be good people. We do have worth and self-value. But our challenge now is not just to look at us and the people beside us, but there's a God whose standards we need to meet. So now we need to see ourselves through his lens and his standards. So we're doing to do nothing through selfishness or empty, empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important. And what that statement means is to hold someone above or, or regard them as superior or better or higher. Can you admit it's hard? To, regard, to view someone as more important than you, to put their interests before yours. For that reason, some of us, we may not even invite someone to some, a, a gathering may have, like, she may meet someone, he may meet someone, I'll invite them to the next party. Or maybe there is a grant you know about, and like, I'll keep this one to myself. I know they could use the grant too, but... I'll keep this one. It's, it's hard for us to put someone else's agenda or regard them as more important because we want to get ahead. We want to advance. So this is something that's really hard to do. But as Christ followers, we're called to do that. And he goes on to say in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. One thing I like about God and as he gives us instructions He's not calling us in our love towards others to do anything he hasn't already done or modeled. And this is how Christ modeled that. It goes on to say in verse 6, Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So this is a loaded passage. So it starts out by telling us how Christ, he emptied himself. He came from heaven. So this passage, it, it affirms what we believe about Christ, his preexistence, that he existed in the beginning with God. If you read in John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And it goes on to say how Christ was present and involved in creation. So we find out, okay, Christ, he's one with God. He's in heaven, the place we're all trying to get to. He actually left heaven. He came down, he emptied himself, and he did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. Sometimes we feel entitled if we have a certain status or position or if I have a certain relationship with someone, I feel entitled to their honor, to their love, to their money, to their time, to their attention. Christ, he didn't feel entitled because when he came, if you study the life of Christ and the gospels, you see Christ, he didn't get a lot of honor. He was born in a manger, a lowly manger. He worked, he grinded, people didn't honor him, and yet he was okay with that. For us, we're, we want to be honored. We want people to esteem us. We're not always willing to sacrifice that 
to help and to serve others. But yet Christ, God in flesh, he did that. He didn't he didn't say, I'm God, bow down to me, worship me. So not only did he take a downgrade, how many of us would take a downgrade? We want upgrades. We even sing about it. Let me, let me upgrade you. Yeah, we want upgrades. But Christ, he took a downgrade, a demotion. Would any of us stay in our current position because we see what God is doing in that office, on that job, so we can make a difference? Will we pass up a promotion? Will we stay in that neighborhood because we see the neighbors we're starting to build relationships with? Or we want to move over there because that's moving on up. We always want to move on up. But Christ, his example, I'll go down so that I can make a difference. It's not about me. It's about the people I came that God sent me for. But we're pursuing upgrades, whereas Christ, his example, is a downgrade. So it says not only did he empty himself, but he was made in the likeness of men. He became like the people he created. The closest example I can think of this is maybe a regression to our children. Do we want to go back to that stage? No, and that can't even compare to God coming down and taking on the form of a lowly man. So he emptied himself, and you know what he did? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Obedience, that is a sign of humility. Not only are we challenged to exchange me for we today, we're also challenged to explain, exchange my for his, my agenda for his will. Do we love God and others enough to be obedient when it's not what I want to do, what I like doing? Can I give up my way of doing things and my desires to be obedient as Christ was? And then the passage says not only was he obedient, but he even, he even died on the cross. For some of us, we may gloss over that, even death on a cross. Okay, I know he died on the cross. But do you all know about crucifixion in that day? what type of death that was? It wasn't any old death. That was a criminal's death. So death on the cross was a big deal. That meant he took, he took the punishment for someone else. He died in disgrace and shame so that you and I won't have to live a life of disgrace and shame. This morning, we, uh, before our, our, we uh, gathered to worship, I may have shared this before, we gather in rallies, um, at those who've come to serve our bridge builders, and we share reasons we're happy to come into the house of the Lord. That is definitely reason to be happy that we can show up, that we do have forgiveness of sins, because Christ, he loved us. God loved us so much that he sent his son and he died a shameful death. So looking at his example, I'm going to share some more how this can play out in our own lives. How can we emulate Christ emptying himself, walking in obedience and so forth because his love was a selfless love. He put the needs of others before his glory, before his honor. So this is what it looks like for us. The first thing we may need to do is to practice some self-denial. You know those things we enjoy doing and like to do? I'm living my best life. I don't care about you. We may not say that, but our actions suggest that. Paul actually had to deal with this in Scripture as it pertained to liberties. You know, as people are coming to Christ, and, and this actually had to do with meat, uh, sacrifice to idols. You have people like, I can eat meat. I don't have to stop eating meat. But other people who see them eating meat, like, oh, my goodness, that was a sacrifice to an idol. That's sinful. And so for them, if they do it, it would cause them to stumble. In our day, it may be things like, okay, it's permissible for me to drink, but if I'm, I have a bunch of alcohol around a friend or brother who's struggling with drunkenness, maybe I shouldn't. Or in our relationship, there are so many ways this can play out as it pertains to our liberties. But this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 9 through 13. He says, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? 
For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. Then in chapter 10, verses 23 through 24 in the CSB, it reads, Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything builds up. No one is to seek his own good, but the good of the other person. Are we willing to deny ourselves certain liberties and pleasures for the sake of those who are coming to Christ, for the sake of those who are growing in Christ. Now, we're consumed in our liberties, and we push them to the extreme. How far can I go? But are we willing to pull it in? Like, I know I can do this, but I'm willing to deny myself so that someone else can have an abundant life in Christ, so that my witness will give God glory. So that's one thing we can do. We can deny ourselves, self-denial. Another is radical obedience. If we truly love God, we'll obey his commandments. I'll exchange my way of doing things for his standard and prescribed way of doing things. So I want you to think for a minute. What is that one thing when you go to do it? It's like, he'll forgive me just this one time. I'm covered by grace. Yes, that thing. Do you love God enough to stop doing that thing? That thing. Love is not selfish. So we're not just called to love each other, our horizontal relationship. We have a vertical relationship with God too. Do we love him enough to walk in radical obedience? And it's leading up, there's a very profound reason why we need to embrace this this concept of not only loving others, but loving God. They're all connected. They all serve a purpose so that we can do those, see God do those things, greater things in and through us. So we need to, if we're really going to say love is not selfish, and I'm exercising that agape love, that an unconditional love that emulates the love God has for us, the love Christ showed by coming down in the form of mankind, by not feeling entitled to the honor that he was due, by dying a criminal's death. Am I prepared to emulate that love by denying myself, by walking in radical obedience? And another is to embrace suffering. Another thing that came up in our rally this morning while we're thankful that we can gather here is we have the liberty to actually come and worship in safety. We're not hiding. We drove here. No one's hunting us down. So most of us, we may may not be called to make a sacrifice to the point of death, but there are some things we do need to sacrifice, things we aren't willing to lay at the cross, things such as our reputation, our good name, our prestige, our comfort. There's an area of my life, God, he continues to challenge me. And you may share the same. Often people ask, what do you do? I'm like, can I tell them what I do? Or what are they going to say? Or how are they going to respond? But God's like, no, tell people what you do. So when I tell them what I do, of course it opens up a conversation about church and my faith and things like that. But you know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid of being categorized as one of those Christians, that I'm judgmental. But we already discussed love is not rude. So you know I'm not rude. I know you're not rude either. So sometimes that's a a, a scapegoat. I don't want to be labeled one of those. I want to be comfortable. I want them to invite me to the parties. I don't want them to hush when I come into the room. But God's like, Be prepared. If they do label you one of those Christians, it's okay as long as you're not being rude like some of those Christians. It's okay if you can't win the argument. You don't have to show you're so smart and you have it all together. We have to be willing 
to sacrifice in order to tell other people about Jesus Christ, the Christ who gave himself to die for our sins. So are we willing to sacrifice and to be so selfless that we're going to start telling people where we come on Sunday mornings? Are we going to tell people why we wake up for six weeks in a row on a Saturday morning to gather with other men in a small group? Are we going to tell people why you don't work late on Wednesdays because you're going to praise team rehearsal or you're going to small group? Are we going to tell people what we do and why we do it? because it opens up opportunities for us to share our faith. Just this week, um, sometimes when I get my hair done, I'll say, okay, I have a speaking engagement. I didn't get my hair done this week, but in the past. I'll say, I have a speaking engagement. I get my nails done, like, oh, okay, oh, so you passed, or you're at a church. And sometimes it's nerv- I'm nervous to say those things, but just say it, and I learn more about them. Most of the time, people, they tell you things about themselves. You're like, like, oh, okay, you practiced this. Oh, you were this, and now you're this. God, he's opening up opportunities for us to share our faith. So another challenge for us today is to embrace suffering. And if we explore the context in which uh, Paul is writing in the book of Philippians, the church, they are facing opposition. They're facing false teachers and people they're like wanting to preach for the wrong motives and for their own agenda. And they're starting to face opposition because of their faith. So he's telling them Christ suffered. We need to be prepared to suffer for Christ. Are we prepared to do that? We get to live. We may lose our reputation, but we're alive. Are we prepared to sacrifice because my love isn't selfish? I care more about the we than the me. I care more about his plan and his agenda than my plan, my desire, and my advancement in life. So not only are we to deny ourselves, Not only are we to walk in radical obedience, but we must embrace suffering. That is what true love looks like. I'm willing to suffer. Sometimes we say, if something happens to my child, of course I'll jump in front of a bus for them. But do you know that that individual you're afraid to talk to is somebody's child? This week, Um, someone in our family passed. My dad, the eldest brother of 10, he passed. And as I was talking to my dad this week, you know what he was able to tell me? He was like, but I know I shared Christ. He can, his conscience can rest because my uncle heard the truth about Jesus Christ. Someone else, we don't know when it's their last day. That can be your opportunity to jump in front of the bus. For God's child, someone for whom Christ died, just jumping out there and saying, I love Jesus. Do you want to come to church with me? I love Jesus. And I love other people. Hey, come over to my house for a potluck. Let's go on a play date. Let's go to the park. If you're in the gym, I remember I had this other, <laughs> this other interesting opportunity in the gym. There was a joke being made, and sometimes I'm like, do I really want to tell them <laughs> what I do? And someone, they talked about someone uh, being like a, a preacher, a pastor. They were like, oh, there are a lot of those here. I'm like, I'm offended. And then I'm like, oh, you are. But it was joking, so now they know. But we were still able to dialogue and discourse because sometimes people do need to see something different. Not all Christians are like those Christians who may need to listen to this series. (laughs) So are we willing to deny ourselves, to walk in radical obedience and to embrace suffering for the individuals in your family, my family, other family? Aren't you thankful for the people who ministered to maybe your parent, your brother, your sister, so now that you know Jesus, I'm grateful. Another assignment we're doing in um, our coaches group, we're doing this faith genealogy where we're trying to trace back who told whom about Jesus such that it got to us. How cool is that, that someone was so obedient that in time it reached me? And I'm saved. I have life because of someone else's selfless selfless love. Because it's not always popular. It wasn't popular (laughs) to the churches that Paul is writing to. And it's not popular now. But it's what we're called to do. So again, we're called to 
to self-denial, radical obedience, embrace suffering. And we go on to read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you see what I saw in this passage? What followed Christ's humility? Esteem and favor. God elevated him. God does the elevating. We don't have to do it. We don't have to chase and grind for, 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 for favor and our upgrades. God, he does it. When we put his agenda first, we shine and we, we rise. And something else we need to see in this verse is it may not come right away. We may not get that vindication on earth or during our day, but it says in verse 10 and in verse 11, every knee will bow, will confess. So there are eschatological implications about this. And that means there are implications about the future and end times of what will happen when Christ, when he returns this time in his full glory, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So there, there's future hope for us. So as we're denying ourselves here on earth, as we're walking in radical obedience, as we're embracing suffering, there's a day we can look forward to when we're in God's presence. That's whose standards we want to meet. That's whose applause we want. That's whose nod we want. That's whose smile and, a, and favor and approval we want. Not our neighbors, not our supervisors, because that, that's going to fade away. That's, that's not lasting. But you know what, Christ, he had that in view while he was here and while he was suffering. He had hope, and it's the same hope we have. He knew that when he died on that cross, although he cried like, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. But if you remove this cup, but he knew what will happen. When Satan tempted him to turn the bread, the stone into bread and to, to throw himself down, down from a cliff, you know, he combated Satan with God's word because he knew what was ahead. He knew the glory that will come. He knew the lives that will be saved. Well, you know what? As Satan is tempting us this week and saying, okay, you can do it. You don't have to be obedient. You look out for everybody else. It's time to do you. I want you not to think about today, the here and now. Think about what's coming, the reward that is coming, the rest that is coming, the favor that is coming, the crown that is coming, the streets paved the gold that are coming, the parties and the fun times in the presence of God that are coming. So we have hope even as we're living out this selfless love where sometimes like, I don't even feel appreciated. It doesn't matter what they think. It matters what God thinks and what he sees. And it matters what that person thinks who you're going to impact. That person who's like, you love me that much? And that gets to the next part as we finish up this passage and we look down in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 15. Listen to this. It says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in this world. So he says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And, and that term grumbling or disputing, it has the sense of murmuring or secret debate. You know how we say things under our breath or we vent to other people. It's like, stop your mumbling, stop your complaining. When we're selfish, those are the things we do. We grumble, we complain. I don't want to do this, but I've got to do this. That's a sign of selfishness. Stop it. It's like, don't do that. 
I'm at work in you. I want you to do these great things. Why? So you can appear blameless and innocent in the world we're in. People are looking at us. It does matter what we do. Sometimes we, we, we fixate on the fact I'm not perfect and no one's perfect. We, we accept that, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to do better and to be better. That's what God has called us to do. He has said, because you appear as lights in the world. You may recall a few weeks ago I said that when our love shines, our light shines. So when we are walking in selfless love, it gives our light an opportunity to shine in a world that's not doing the right thing. People are used to people backstabbing them and doing the wrong thing. Then you show up, you're honest. You shared the opportunity with me. You didn't take it for yourself. That looks different than what's happening in the rest of the world. We have an opportunity to be lights and to show people what true Christianity, what, it, what that looks like, what it means to truly love God and to love others. When we replace me with we and my with his, that is how we express selfless love. So we have a challenge this week. You've probably guessed it. We're going to do some replacing. You know, when we come to Christ and, and we're called to cast off certain things, he always tells us to put something on. If we're casting off hate, we're putting on love. If we're casting off immorality, we're putting on purity. If we're casting off lying, we're putting off truth. So this week, as we're setting aside me, I want us to think about we, the teams we serve on, the body we're a part of, the communities in which God has placed us. Think about how our actions can impact we, the difference we can make for we. This week, I want to, us to replace my will, my desires, my agenda for his, my standards for his. To help us to remember this, I have an activity for us. I want you to grab your smartphones, if you have them, or iPads, everyone. Take it up. And I want you to put it in, put out, pull out your camera, put it in selfie mode. So I know we're talking about not being selfish, but walk, walk with me. We're going to redeem selfie mode this morning. So I want you to... Huddle with someone who's next to you, or you can pan the audience, and I want you to take a wee pit. We often call them ussies, but for the purpose of this message, we're going to take a wee pit. Take a wee pit. Get together. Okay, you have your picks. Get together or scan the room. This is your, your wee pit. Are you impressed? It looks good. Let that selfish spirit go to hell. <laughs> Your picture looks good. Oh, oh, I get a wee pick too. Oh, oh, what's happening? it. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I can participate. Yeah, the speaker needs to apply it too. It's not just for you all. So we have these wee picks. And what we're going to do with our wee picks this week is they're going to serve as a reminder that I need to replace me with we and my will with his will. They're going to serve as a reminder that we're a part of a body and that we're truly better together. When we put aside like our agendas and our will, we could do greater things. Imagine us having more small groups having a greater impact in the community. I know there's this push for Easter. Imagine creating this overwhelmingly warm and welcome environment for all the people that God wants to reach. Imagine more youth in Oxygen and more youth in downtown because now we're showing that I'm not going to be selfish with my time, my talents, or my treasure. I'm going to show my love through those. Let this be a reminder of the we. How can you love the we more? Let it also be a reminder that if you're in Christ, he has called you to replace my will with his will. When we're in Christ, we're not just saved, but we're now submitted to him. We're following him and we're following his agenda. 
So we're replacing me with we and my with his. So this is your reminder. And one more thing to test, are you really selfless? Before you post another selfie to Facebook, Instagram, or any social media, you have to post your we pick. We pick before the selfie, okay? And when you post your we pick, so that I know you did your homework. For those of you who don't know, I used to be a teacher. So that I know you did your homework, you're going, you're going to tag at the bridge DC, hashtag we pick, hashtag love is greater, okay? Your first step towards selflessness. So before you post another selfie, post your we pick, okay? <laughs> Do it again, okay? So that's our assignment this week. We're going to replace me with and my with we're going to replace me with, we. my with, we. because love is not selfish. Our light shines when our love shines. So as the praise team comes up, I'm going to pray for us. Because a message like this, it can be hard to apply. So I'm going to pray that we're able to walk in victory and love this week. I'm going to pray for us to actually make those exchanges. And I'm actually going to pray for maybe there's someone here who hasn't experienced that agape love that Christ, he died to give us.